Hello, everyone. Welcome to SQF Stronger. Uh, today, we have the honor to have Hans van Bilber here and talking about the SQF bearing selection process. So please, Hans, the stage is yours. Thank you. Yes, good morning and welcome to this session on our bearing selection process. Uh, first, some session basics. Uh, you are all muted. We will run this session as long as you want, but uh, the plan is and this presentation is something like an hour. Uh, we are recording the session. And we will, of course, run questions and answers, but we do that after the presentation. So um, once you come up with something on your mind that is a question, uh, use the chat function to, to write it, to put that question down. Uh, and please, uh, state name and occupation when you type in the question. This will be quite useful, in particular if you want us to come back to you. So, my name is Hans van der Bey, and I will be your guide today. I have spent almost four decades working with application engineering at SKF. And today I work with the documenting knowledge and I'm developing application engineering training. Uh, today we shall take a thorough look at SKF's bearing selection process. As you may know, uh, the bearing selection process is the way the engineering section in our rolling bearings catalog 17,000 is laid out. Uh, some years ago, I was deeply involved in developing this process together with other colleagues. So I'm confident that I can describe the process and also respond to the questions you may have. And please remember to use the chat function for questions. Uh, the agenda for today's session is as follows. First, we start with a short introduction, uh, emphasizing the importance of the bearing selection process, uh, touching on how this process is equally important for development of new machines, or to be used as a checklist uh, when checking up or troubleshooting existing machinery. Uh, secondly, um, during the session, I will guide you through the different steps of this application analysis process with focus on the rolling bearings catalog 17,000 uh, content. And at the end, I will summarize the key messages of this session. As an introduction, I want to underline that the bearing selection process is developed for and it's equally useful when developing new machines as when you're analyzing existing machinery. That could be troubleshooting or if you want to make an upgrade, changed performances and so forth. Um, it doesn't matter whether the uh, bearing selection process is used to ensure a robust bearing arrangement in a development project, or if we use it to find what's wrong if a machine or a bearing arrangement is, is underperforming. Uh, the same considerations that influence bearing performance must still be made. Uh, when we develop the engineering section of the rolling bearing catalog 17,000, uh, the need for a checklist that ensures robustness in, in bearing arrangements was our driver. Uh, and when the necessary steps uh, were identified, written down and tested, we decided to give the engineering section the name SKF bearing selection process. Uh, the, the bearing selection process is a step-by-step -step process that guides you through all relevant design considerations for a bearing arrangement. Uh, 
in the catalogs, there are lots of embedded application design rules and guidelines. Uh, and the format today uh, makes it not, it's not possible for me to go into detail on that, but you have to investigate that on your own. Uh, and you will find that the process helps you to evaluate all key factors. And, and we have given it as much as possible of a logic order to follow. Now, each step here represents a specific group of related design, design considerations, which makes it easier to find the information on a specific topic. Now, in reality, however, the word process may be a little misleading. You will find interdependencies that require you to loop back and forth between different steps here. So uh, an iterative approach uh, is often needed. We will touch upon that during the presentation. Uh, it should be emphasized that the online version of the bearing selection process is designed to make it easy to navigate between the steps by clicking on the individual active step icons. You saw that in the presentation, it flipped through automatically. When you do this online, you run this, you will jump back and forth. You just push the relevant icon, whether you want to go back and look at lubrication or temperature, whatever it is, you can go back and forth very easily. Um, now, apart from a, a printed real hands-on catalog, there is of course a uh, PDF version uh, possible to download from, from the sgf.com uh, group homepage. I should, however, underline that the online version is always the most recent and it's up to date. Now, in the next part of this session, I will explain all the individual steps more in detail, focusing on the content, uh, different tables, graphs and flowcharts. All this is published in, in the Rolling Bearings catalog. Uh, beside the bearing selection process, our support to customers includes application engineering service with appropriate SDF supporting calculation tools used to verify that a, a bearing arrangement is robust and yet cost effective. The SGF Bearing Select is one example, and that is available via the SGF Group homepage. Bearing arrangement design and bearing selection is a challenging exercise, and um, that needs a systematic approach where we consider all these um, parameters that uh, influence the result. Um, the bearing selection process is less laid out so uh, it ensures awareness that calculating bearing life alone is not sufficient to obtain a robust bearing solution. In this sense, all considerations are equally important. Uh, rather than being just an encyclopedia full of facts, the bearing selection process is written to be a designer's guide. Um, we have put lots of emphasis on, on using an active, direct tone of voice, <clears throat> speaking to the designer. And uh, this is via the Rolling Bearings Catalog, very visible and, and hopefully quite available. Now, uh, this process is not only the way we have organized the engineering section in our catalog, it is actually our internal application engineering master template. Um, so we use the bearing selection process in our daily support to our customers. Uh, the better we together understand and make use of the bearing selection process, the more robust the solutions will be. 
Now, we're constantly developing our engineering software tools for our own application engineers and also for our customers. I mentioned the SKF bearing select previously, and this is to support uh, in, in the bearing selection efforts. Uh, it's not happening overnight, but we are gradually converting to using the same icons as we use in the bearing selection process. Uh, and we adopt the programs to support the process to make uh, the user feel comfortable. Uh, as you may know, uh, the software tools are ranging from online tools, externally accessible for, for our customers, towards purely internal tools, only accessible to the SKF engineering community. And depending on what stage in, in the design you are, or in the troubleshooting efforts, the right tool shall be used for the right analysis. Uh, and one thing that this stepwise selection process uh, supports in is uh, to make sure that no input is taken for granted, but uh, it is thoroughly assessed together uh, inside SKF and of course together with our customers. Uh, we try as often as possible to use uh, sensitivity studies to um, evaluate the robustness against variations in application parameters and operating conditions. And uh, extra input might be added during the, the uh, application design process to further fine tune uh, the outcome. Now, as always, the more advanced uh, the software tool is the more advanced the input must be, and it must also be carefully assessed. Now we have reached uh, the first step in the bearing selection process, performance and operating conditions. Here we support the user in defining, understanding and documenting the required performance, the operating conditions, and other application prerequisites. Now this may seem as a simple first step that may be taken lightly upon, but it is actually very often here in this step that the origin of underperforming machines and bearing arrangements is found when we make root cause analysis. So spend a lot of time on this. To be able to design a, a well-working bearing arrangement, uh, the required performance and the actual operating conditions must be understood and documented. Uh, now, together with the customer, we define which operating conditions the machines shall manage and what this means for the bearing arrangement selection. Now, therefore, the bearing selection process includes a, a new type of checklist that helps the customer identify and consider the factors needed to design a well-performing uh, bearing arrangement. Um, it, it might be difficult for you to see, but this chart visualizes in, in a compact way the link between the principal operating conditions, the application requirements, and various aspects of a bearing arrangement. Uh, the chart is, is for sure not yet complete, as you may have to consider other factors and interrelationships to obtain a robust and cost-effective solution, but it, it offers a very good overview and it is a, a good start of the data collection process. Look at it as a reminder to not overlook uh, any influencing factor. Uh, the bearing selection process also includes an application questionnaire to help the catalog user to provide basic information when contacting the uh, SKF application engineering service. Uh, this is not rocket science, but it does help to start structuring the most important data. 
this application data sheet can be found at the end of the printed rolling bearings catalog and online it's of course available as a PDF document that can be downloaded. The second section expands on the content of the second process step. Uh, it describes different bearing arrangements and it provides information on what to consider when selecting a bearing arrangement and the types of bearings to use with it. In order to deliver the relevant performance and manage the operating conditions and the requirements that have been collected in, in the previous first step of the process. This logic next step is to define the type of bearing arrangement as well as the appropriate bearing types. Uh, besides introducing a defined nomenclature to avoid misunderstandings, this step in the bearing selection process focuses on describing in detail the differences between the locating non-locating bearing arrangements, the adjusted bearing arrangements, uh, and floating bearing arrangements. And it explains the related design intents, properties and design criteria of each arrangement. Uh, these different bearing types for the various bearing positions in a certain arrangement are discussed and illustrated with assembly sketches. Uh, the online version of the bearing selection process uh, contains user-friendly active links. You see in the upper right the corner there, there are four sentences with a little plus online. Uh, once you click one of these pluses, uh, it allows you to navigate towards the appropriate product sections, uh, figures or overview matrices whenever applicable. So it ex expands on these topics here. So again, I want to emphasize that um, this rolling bearings catalog 17,000 in general and, and, and the bearing selection process in particular is really uh, developed to be used online. Uh, now the second step of the bearing selection process includes a reworked bearing type selection matrix. It's of course impossible to see here, but it again, it's, it's, uh, it's developed for online use. Um, and the matrix is turned into a more practical guiding structure for the machine designer. Next to the known design criteria as being load carrying capacity, ability to uh, sus uh, sustain misalignment. Uh, we show typical arrangements and suitable uh, considerations. We have uh, added an extra group of possible design features uh, to make the overview even more complete. This extra group considers uh, whether there is availability of integral sealing in the bearings, uh, separate ring mounting like a separable taper roller bearing or cylindrical roller bearing, uh, if the bearing type is available with a tapered bore, uh, or if there are standard housing and accessories available, which might help to, to make a, a unit concept, <clears throat> bolt on type of mounting and so forth. Uh, the bearing arrangement and types process step concludes with an overview of the different selection criteria. And again, uh, this checklist is clickable online and under each of these pluses you expand. Uh, we'll try to illustrate it with um, easy to understand pictures and we make reference to the upgraded, upgraded bearing selection matrix. Uh, 
interesting to notice perhaps we have uh, added cost and availability as a selection criterion. And now this is linked to the introduction of the term popular items uh, in the rolling bearings catalog, representing items that uh, have a high level of uh, availability. And, and these are marked in the product tables with a little arrow, the little symbol. Uh, this section introduces the third step of the bearing selection process and describes how to determine a bearing size that is sufficiently strong, either to uh, provide a relevant fatigue-based life, L10, or and to provide a relevant resistance to permanent deforma deformation. Now, this section also focuses uh, the new way of representing and explaining the influence of lubrication and contamination on bearing size selection via the rating life. And it provides an extra checklist to be considered before going to the next step of the bearing selection process. Now the bearing size step of the selection process focuses in the first place on two aspects. They're equally important as shown in uh, diagram two here. And these aspects are to deliver the required or expected life under defined operating conditions. Uh, and a resistance to rolling contact fatigue on the rolling elements and raceways. And secondly, a resistance to permanent deformation of rolling elements and raceways due to heavy loads acting on the bearing, either while it's stationary or perhaps oscillating, or if there are high peak loads that occur while the bearing is rotating under lower loading conditions. Now this step in the bearing selection process aims to give better understanding and insights in evaluating bearing rating life making it more clear and accessible to a wider user group. We'll try to take the mystery out of it. Customers don't need to be experts in the first place, but should at least understand the concepts and be able to use it. Uh, our own SKF application engineers are of course experts and should therefore know more background details. Uh, let, let us have a look on a few examples of how the bearing selection process is acting to achieve this goal. The analysis order for size selection based on rating life is grouped and arranged in a logic order, focusing on an easy to understand way of explaining and visualizing the effect of the different calculation factors involved. Uh, the function of the ASKF diagram, uh, this, the diagram as such is not new, but uh, we have uh, a new way of explaining it to make it more clear and easier to use. The horizontal axis here represents the combined influence of load level on the bearing and contamination and how this influences the risk for fatigue. The viscosity ratio kappa represents the lubrication condition and that is indicated by the blue arrow pointing from lower right to upper left and how that influences fatigue. Uh, we have indicated three working areas um, a bit stylistic representing a different status of sensitivity against varying uh, operating conditions. As such, the diagram helps to assess the robustness of the bearing arrangement and guides the user towards the right corrective actions to increase rotating equipment performance. Should I increase the viscosity? Should I buy better filters? should I consider a larger bearing. The, the user is guided 
uh, to use the diagram here to, to evaluate different options. Uh, the lubrication condition kappa is in, in this catalog presented as a gradual change of lubrication condition to avoid the misunderstanding that there is a stepwise change from a pronounced asperity contact condition to a separating oil film happening at a certain kappa value. Instead, we tried to be very clear in that this is a gradual change. Um, the area of potentially beneficial effects on the bearing life from extreme pressure or anti-wear additives at lower kappa values is visually integrated in the same diagram. That's the green, shadow green EP. AW beneficial arrow. Um, and it's also in the text, it's, explain, it's explained how to consider this in the ASKF calculations as well as what to consider regarding the potential negative effects at higher temperatures. Some of these additives may turn to be a bit aggressive. Now further, this step gives a basic explanation of the contamination factor eta c uh, being a calculation factor to consider the increased local contact stress due to indentations caused by overrolling contamination particles uh, which increases the risk for fatigue the more uh, detailed eta c calculation from previous catalogs is now moved to a separate PDF document. Uh, of course, available, clickable in the online catalog. Now, this med method is also embedded in the SKF engineering tools. For instance, the uh, SKF bearing select. The simplified tables for ETAC guidelines are shown. And again, uh, clickable via a link. Besides presenting the uh, static load rating as an equally important check in the process of defining the bearing size, the following two aspects also need special attention. At first, the bearing selection process provides the user with two separate uh, guiding tables, one for ball bearings and one for roller bearings for the required static safety factors. Uh, as a new um, horizontal table entry, the S0 values given for continuous motion relate to the influence of permanent deformation on performance, ranging from noticeable friction peaks, vibrations and re reduced fatigue resistance for the lowest static safety factor values to no influence on these performance factors for the highest static safety factor values. Now the certainty of load level is the other new uh, vertical table entry and it reflects how well we know the actual bearing load and or how well uh, the, bear, the actual bearing load can be predicted. Now these new legends uh, make the tables easier to use compared to the previous. Now secondly, the former vague or undefined term shock load is consistently replaced by the term peak load, uh, defining it clearly as a high load acting for a short period in time. The fact that such a peak load is only there for an extremely short period implies that it may not influence the mean load eventually used in the fatigue life calculation. The amplitude F maximum of the peak load is the important value to be considered and this shall be evaluated against the bearing static load rating C0 using a suitable static safety factor S0. Uh, a point to notice uh, 
the values that we show in the catalog, the S0 values, they are safety factors. And that is not the same as a limit, because if we are at the limit, there is no safety. So the, that's the distinction between a safety factor and a limit. Uh, finally, as a reminder that bearing life rating and resistance to permanent deformations are not the only size related factors to consider. Uh, we have added a little checklist at the end of the chapter here. Further guidance is given to consider uh, the grease life for cap bearings, uh, the allowed axial to radial load ratio, the minimum load requirements, uh, the adjusted reference speed and limiting speed, uh, misalignment and stabilization class for the temperature. For each of these aspects, the um, related product section shall be consulted and, and uh, online, of course, once you see uh, such a bullet point with a little arrow, that is a clickable link to the relevant part of the catalog. Uh, this fourth section describes the fourth step on how to choose between grease or oil lubrication, how to select a suitable grease, and how to select a suitable oil. To some extent, we have updated the, this content here. The next step here in the bearing selection process is to consider what type of lubrication shall be used given the application conditions provided. Uh, the lubrication section starts with a flow chart uh, aimed at helping the catalog user in the design process whether to select oil or grease lubrication. Uh, by answering a few basic questions and considering several fundamental selection criteria, the user is guided towards the most suitable lubrication selection. Uh, the relubrication section for Greece is equipped with a table comprising more interval reduction factors. For instance, the relubrication, the, the influence of contamination is further fine-tuned uh, in a separate table here. Now, the, determining the grease quantity for initial fill and relubrication, as well as relubrication procedures, are explained in a, a clear way, offering sometimes a general formula. There are design rules and, and there are recommendations of good practice. Again, online clickable, you see the pluses there. And to support the selection of a suitable grease, uh, we make reference to the SKF Lube Select, also publicly available via the group homepage, and related selection rules are listed and, and explained. The SKF traffic light concept for grease temperature performance is illustrated for all SKF aftermarket greases in an extended table. And additional factors and, and considerations for selecting a grease are listed and explained. Same uh, grease selection chart as used in, for instance, the SKF bearing maintenance handbook is the central part. Uh, it simplifies the choice, uh, but from a liability point of view, we are only focusing SKF products. Uh, grease selection does not start with viscosity to the indifference to oil. Uh, for grease, other properties are more important. For instance, the NLGI number, the mechanical stability, the oil bleeding ability, the useful temperature range, the additive package, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, compared to oil, this is very different because you can easily find 
an oil family with the right additive package and choose from maybe seven or even more different viscosities, for instance, a gear oil. Uh, and if you compare that situation to grease, you might have only one or two greases that fulfills your, your specification. So that's why they're different. Now, the typical oil selection criteria is viscosity and viscosity index. Uh, oil type is there and additives um, that we have tried to explain in a structured way. When it comes to oil change intervals, a uh, new table is shown um, where there is a recommendation for approximate mineral oil change intervals, depending on the oil lubrication system, as well as typical operating conditions. Uh, at the end, for those who want to see additional information on SKF's range of um, oil lubrication products, um, the online version of the bearing selection process offers a link towards uh, SKF lubrication solutions. It's a, it's a big homepage, lots of information. Um, now, estimating the operating temperature and verifying the speed limitations is a critical aspect of the analysis of an application. Hence, this section introduces the fifth step of the bearing selection process. It collects temperature, friction and speed in one chapter. These three factors are interdependent with temperature as the most prominent parameter since it influences bearing performance in so many ways. The first step in understanding temperature is explaining the term thermal equilibrium in a bearing application and providing details of the relationships between the friction, operating temperature and power loss of components within an application and guidance on what to consider. These factors in turn have interdependencies with many others such as bearing size, bearing loads and lubrication conditions. This section also zooms in on um, how operating temperatures can be estimated and it speaks about speed limitations. We are using uh, the speed ratings and we are uh, explaining this in terms that are not to be considered as absolute black or white sharp limits. We point at what influencing factors should be observed and what could be tweaked and so forth. Now, in this uh, step, the bearing selection process is starting with explaining the term thermal equilibrium, meaning that a balance between generated heat coming from the bearing and the application and dissipated heat is reached. The operating temperature of a bearing is the steady state temperature it attains when running, and this in thermal equilibrium with its surrounding elements. Further, the interdependencies between bearing size, operating temperature and lubricate condition at one hand and load speed and lubricant viscosity at the other hand are illustrated schematically in a diagram. Now the intention with this is to create an awareness towards the typical iterative approach to this analysis in order to achieve an optimum design for bearing arrangements. The schematic sketch of the frictional moment or frictional torque in a typical bearing as a function of speed and viscosity shows how friction changes. We have visualized four distinguishable zones representing different lubrication conditions. We have a boundary layer lubrication condition to the far left in the diagram. 
the next zone is a mixed lubrication condition zone entering into a full film lubrication condition and further on to the far right there is a full film lubrication condition but we start to notice thermal and starvation effects uh, in order to uh, simplify the readability and to keep focus on the main process concept, the extensive and complicated friction calculation formula and tables from the past, uh, they're moved to a separate linked document. Uh, also, a link is added to lead the reader towards uh, the SKF bearing calculator as the recommended tool to perform friction calculations. These are e easy to get lost in calculations, so I, re I really, really recommend uh, to use the bearing calculator. Uh, now the thermal equilibrium diagram shows that the bearing and the application together determine the operating temperature. The power loss, that is the red curve, decreases as temperature rises. This is since the viscous losses are reduced and the cooling blue line is increasing. This since more heat is dissipated. Now when the power loss and the cooling effect are equal, uh, we have reached the equilibrium temperature marked with capital A. Now if this temperature A is too high for some reason. More heat must be removed, for instance, by oil cooling, and then a lower equilibrium temperature B will be reached. So uh, what influences temperature in a common application? Cooling factors for escape standard bearing housings, plumber block type have been introduced. Uh, we have never shown this in previous catalogs and I, I doubt that I've seen it in any competitor catalog either. Um, the description of reference and limiting speed is simplified and tuned in such a way that the reader should understand that these speeds are not sharp limits. The diagrams and formula to calculate the adjusted uh, reference speed are not shown anymore. Again, they were too complicated, but there is a uh, reference made to the SKF bearing calculator to perform these um, calculations, um, emphasizing a conservative approach to the results as the actual heat dissipation for the application is not included. Um, we do give some hands-on advice on what should be considered when approaching or exceeding the reference or the limiting speeds and it's put in a comprehensive list at the end of this step. Um, please notice that operating temperature and speed will have influence on the choices that we make in, for instance, executions step later on in the bearing selection process, where, for instance, a suitable clearance clause is selected, and that must be done bearing in mind what will be the operating and the startup temperature development. Uh, step number six of the bearing selection process comprises recommendations and requirements for designing bearing interfaces. And these include uh, criteria for selecting bearing fits for shaft and housings, recommended fits for standard conditions, recommendations for specifying geometrical tolerances of bearing seats, tables to help determine minimum, maximum and probable values of clearance or interference between the bearing and its seat. Uh, we hint on provisions for mounting and dismounting. Also, we include recommendations for the axial support of bearing rings. 
uh, and some further design considerations for bearing interfaces. <clears throat> this section is mainly focusing on the uh, revised and slightly modified fit recommendation tables provided. As an example, um, I show table two here. It includes the recommended seat tolerances under standard conditions for roller bearings. Please notice that this table is valid for all roller bearings except needle roller bearings. For each shaft diameter range in the fit selection table, we are now showing the recommended dimensional tolerance clause, the recommended total radial runout clause, the recommended total axial runout clause, and the recommended RA value for the seat. There is no need anymore to look in, in many different tables to define the different seat tolerances. So this makes it much more user friendly for the designer. And of course, it helps in avoiding mistakes. Some larger spherical roller bearing sizes needed a bit of an adjustment to a slightly less tight uh, interference shaft fit. All changes are thoroughly analyzed to avoid risk for ring creep, while at the same time not risking a too high hoop stress. Uh, in particular, the spherical roller bearings from size 300 up to 360 millimeters bore diameter needed a bit of a relief. Um, yeah, you see, we, we really go to details on this. Um, we are no longer showing ex example machines, and this is to avoid uh, conflicting information with former publications, you know, operating conditions and, and performance requirements are changing and hence we will not anymore show information that is ambiguous. Further, the text points out that the shaft and housing tolerances are not linear with size and therefore shall be chosen in each individual case to obtain the appropriate resulting fit. Uh, this is to avoid wrong fit selection caused by copy paste of, for instance, H7 housing tolerance from one size of machine to, to another. Um, besides calculating the, consulting the tables provided in the rolling bearings catalog, to find information about bearing tolerances, seat tolerances and resultant fits. The SKF bearing calculator provides a similar function for every individual bearing size. Uh, the bearing calculator helps you with a little bit of clever graphics showing uh, uh, the resulting range clearance or interference. To complete this step of the bearing selection process, uh, recommendations regarding provisions for mounting and dismounting, axial location of bearing rings and radially free mounted bearings for axial load are discussed and illustrated with sketches. Since uh, data for producing race weights directly on the shafts or in, in the housings is product specific, uh, it's now in the present catalog advice to get such information via the SKF application engineering service. Uh, please notice as well as in the previous step where we looked at temperature that the choices made according to the present step interfaces will have an influence on decisions made in the step execution. For instance, when an appropriate clearance clause is, is to be selected. The seventh step of the bearing selection process deals with defining the bearing execution. 
that is providing recommendations and requirements for selection of the bearing internal clearance or preload, the bearing dimensional tolerances, the appropriate cage where applicable. Sometimes you can choose between different cages. Sometimes for certain bearing types you cannot. Uh, integral seals, uh, where applicable. And finally, additional options such as coatings and other features used to meet any special needs or requirements. This section mainly focuses the importance of selecting correct clearance or preload and how it's explained in the bearing selection process. Diagram one is showing the influence of clearance or preload on relevant operational parameters such as the friction, the size of the loaded zone, and the rating life of a bearing. Uh, it also indicates a recommended zone of operation for general applications as such improving the usefulness of the diagram and it's guiding uh, the designer towards the right clearance selection. Please, however, notice that in the rolling bearings catalog, uh, the clearance range is introduced, that term. This is to make it clear that the selection of a certain clearance clause, for instance, C3 or C4, uh, and not a certain specific clearance selection in so and so many microns shall be made. So we're, we're finding a clearance range here. All clearance influencing parameters are collected in this process step, allowing the designer in a step-by-step -step way to define a recommended minimum radial clearance to make radial bearing arrangements for general conditions more robust. The following clearance influencing parameters and a procedure to follow is proposed. First, consider the required operating clearance. Remember the temperature evaluation we did previously. That will help us here. Uh, secondly, consider the reduction of clearance caused by interference fits that we determined in the previous step. Third is to consider the reduction of clearance caused by temperature difference between the shaft bearing rings and housing. Uh, and then we consider the reduction of clearance caused by other influences such as axial clamping, it's very rarely important. Now based on the above, uh, calculate the required initial internal clearance and finally select the initial clearance range. Depending on the application, despite the previously mentioned robust zone of operation with clearance, preload might be required or more suitable. Uh, the catalog content related to this process step is explaining a few general considerations related to back to back versus face to face arrangements, uh, preloading with springs, uh, calculating the appropriate preload is recommended to be done in SKF Simpro quick, uh, publicly available. Uh, with an agreement with SKF, of course, or the SKF Simpro expert, that's an SKF internal program. But the extensive preload information and calculation part from the past, we have also moved this to a separate PDF document. And this is to safeguard that we provide an easy reading of this process step chapter and of course, this is accessible <clears throat> via a link. 
Uh, now, this document describes the primary benefits resulting from preload that could be enhanced stiffness, reduction of noise, improved shaft guidance, compensation for wear or setting. Uh, we may extend bearing service life and we can ensure that they're, they're not, uh, we are not violating the minimum load requirements. Now the bearing tolerance clause that could be uh, normal or P6 or P5 is schematically described in relation to application requirements uh, for precision of rotation and operational, operational speed. There is an interrelation between these. <clears throat> the cage type is inherently related to the bearing execution and is as such logically subject to this process step. The main cage types are described in the rolling bearings catalog under the chapter components and materials. Now also here, uh, the online version offers an active link to easily switch to the related content if the reader wants to know more. In order to neutralize the cage material and manufacturing method discussion and, and this pointless argumentation for a certain standard bearing type, the, the text states that the SKF philosophy is that material and manufacturing methods are chosen to provide the most reliable and cost effective cage considering the manufactured volume. We also have a brief overview regarding different cage materials and, and the properties. Uh, and there is an integral ceiling execution, but the more extensive information referred to this is found in the section bearing basics. Uh, again, uh, the, uh, the above mentioned link. Finally, additional options such as coatings or features for special requirements are described in this section. But uh, again, the deeper information behind these <clears throat> pieces of fact is found in the bearing basics or in the respective product sections part of the catalog. Uh, the eighth and last step of the bearing selection process covers how to select appropriate external seals for rolling bearing applications and the different types of sealing available. Basic preparation and guidelines for mounting and dismounting bearings and various aspects of inspecting and monitoring bearings in operation for the purpose of preventing problems, early failure detection. This section is further only showing a summary of the content of this process step. Because of their importance for bearing application, this section deals mainly with non-contact and contact shaft seals, and it illustrates their various designs and executions. Um, it describes how to select appropriate bearing seals based on several selection criteria. Again, clickable. Um, so there is also a link added to guide the reader towards the SKF Group Seals product homepage. The mounting and dismounting part describes the preparation and guidelines for mounting and dismounting bearings and it now includes an overview of the SKF maintenance product tools. Uh, the section describes various aspects of inspecting and monitoring bearings in operation. This is to detect problems in an early stage. It also gives an introduction to troubleshooting and links to more detailed troubleshooting procedures. Uh, the um, active links to the 
bearing maintenance handbook as well as the bearing damage and failure analysis handbooks. <clears throat> so finally, this section should summarize uh, the key points of today's session. As a summary and conclusion on this session, I have listed the following main key points. The bearing selection process is a structured step-by-step -step designer's guide. It's aimed at achieving robustness, and that is more than calculating life. The bearing selection process provides a logic order of technical considerations and it allows easy navigating between the steps, in particular in the online version, of course. We have added new content like the temperature chapter, quite a few enriched graphs, reviewed tables and logic flowcharts are included. Now the bearing selection process is mastered by SKF's application engineers and it's used consistently in supporting our customers. So that was what I brought today. So thank you this far for your attention. And now let's have a look at questions and answers. I see um, quite some questions rolling in here. Um, there is an interesting question here. Chrysanthi, how difficult is to select the ideal bearing among similars? There are many parameters. Yeah, that, that is, I would say, in a nutshell, uh, the major reason for developing this whole process. There are so many ways to, to solve uh, different sets of parameters. I think by, by following this process, you can evaluate the important parameters and you will zoom in on a few, maybe not one, but a few good solutions. So, the good part of, of the bearing selection process is that it helps you to do this and it is developed and tested by very experienced people. There are no parameters outside this that are needed to reflect on. Uh, second question here, uh, Mohammed. To what extent do you consider the grease as a barrier against contaminations in your calculations? In which calculations and how? Yes, to an extent. Um, if you remember, I talked about the grease relubrication uh, interval procedures. Uh, in that step, uh, the influence of uh, Greece as a barrier is included, in fact. So uh, in this sense, it will help you to evaluate. It will perhaps not give you a, a, a super perfect precise value, but who can do that? You know, there is dirt. Uh, dirt can be so different. Um, that will also be noticed, I believe, in the bearing select program when you describe the presence of uh, contamination. So by, by using these two parts, the relubrication part where you evaluate the um, severity of the surrounding uh, in relation to your relubrication, so one, for instance, if you have a lot of contamination outside, uh, the relubrication part of the process will encourage you to reduce the relubrication interval, that is to push out grease. And in the uh, size selection part of the process, you will see the influence of contamination.
discrimination via the eta c factor. Uh, there's an interesting uh, short thing here. Uh, anonymous, your opinion about insulated bearings? Good point. Uh, I think today that insulated bearings are more important than ever. The reason for saying so is that we are seeing more and more uh, frequency controlled machines and we know that this contributes to increasing the risk for passage of electric current uh, and that has uh, several detrimental effects. Uh, one effect is of course that it uh, drastically reduces the, uh, the grease quality. Other effects are, are noticeable uh, reduction of uh, expected fatigue life. So my opinion on insulated bearings is that they should be used, really. I wonder if I can roll down here to see all questions. Oh, it's difficult. Um, there is a question, who provides reaction to shock load, bearing or suspension first? Yeah, they contribute. Uh, the, the, that needs to be analyzed together. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, most of the force will need to pass through the bearing. Uh, <clears throat> so I think that 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 could be checked. Uh, I don't know, Tove, maybe you can um, scroll down because I, I cannot scroll down here. You can scroll down if you use uh, the bar to the right. Now we see your fantastic motorcycle. Ah, look at that. Okay. Which is very nice. <laughs> yes, it has no brakes, however. Ah. Only one gear. So if you share your desktop again. Uh, I can share. Uh, what happened here? That's funny. So if you share the presentation again, again, mm -hmm. then I can put it up there. Yeah. yeah. So. Does that make sense? Yeah, we are up and running again. Uh, look at that. Uh, Ta-da, Safshin. Is use of ceramic balls contributes to increased life or reduced failure rate? Yeah, it's not an easy question to answer in a general way. Um, if you have if there is a risk for electric current passage, it certainly contributes to an increased service life. And, and if you do that, automatically your failure rate goes down. And the reason for that is uh, ceramic balls are perfect uh, insulation. They, they're even they're insulating better than insulated bearings. That may sound funny, but an insulated bearing has a so-and-so thick ceramic layer usually on the outer ring sometimes on the bore of the inner ring uh, but that layer has a, a certain thickness and it will resist uh, so and so high voltage while the ceramic rolling elements ceramic boards for instance uh, can uh, withstand a considerably higher voltage without anything happening and should there be a passage, it would be like a flash ring to ring. It, it would not go through the ceramic element. So, so in, in the presence of electric current, uh, there is an instant uh, increase of life, automatically a reduced failure rate. Uh, also under lubricating conditions that are not so favorable, uh, we have uh, pronounced asperity contact 
uh, one must observe that the ceramic balls are or rollers they are more or less inert chemically so uh, effects such as smear, smearing in a micro or macro scale will will not occur so uh, in this sense uh, presence of electric current or or lousy lubricating conditions then uh, there are definite advantages of ceramic rolling elements uh, there is a question here in bold. What is the main difference to go for a ball bearing or a roller bearing? Is it only load? I would say load is the main characteristic. The roller bearings have a line contact compared to the ball bearings that have point contacts and, and hence they can carry considerably high loads without creating higher contact stresses. Uh, one should however not uh, forget that the speed is also a part because the ball bearings as a rule they have a, a lower friction. So this is another positive side of small contact area. They, they result in lower friction hence uh, they can be run at higher speeds without causing high temperature. Uh, oh, there is a question, Sachin. Uh, kindly explain in terms of wheel bearings, what is the contribution of axle load, vehicle center of gravity and tire radius in bearing application? I would say that the, the main driver is the axial, axle load, axle load, because it will be there all the time. Uh, the vehicle center of gravity, if you go straight, you will not notice. You only notice the, the center of gravity in relation to the width of the, the, the wheel arrangement when you are in turns. So uh, once that happens, you will put a little bit of extra load on, on the wheels in the outer part of the curve and a little less on the wheels on the inner part. Uh, also the tire radius uh, because usually for vehicles uh, one typically expresses the uh, bearing rating life in millions of kilometers. And uh, when you turn uh, millions of revolutions into millions of kilometers, you will need the, the tire radius to, uh, to, to do that conversion. That's, that's the main reason. Uh, Stefano has a question. How can I choose the right cage type? Operating temperature is important, but what are the other influencing factors to take into account? Uh, I would say yes, temperature is, is my first uh, checkpoint uh, in, in combination with the lubricant perhaps, because um, additives in uh, in lubricants and high temperature may be aggressive to polymer materials for instance uh, other rather extreme but still existing examples of um, lubricant influence on cages is uh, if you have compressors working with ammonia you dissolve so and so much ammonia in the lubricant and uh, Ammonia is known to make uh, deep drawn brass sheet uh, very brittle. So that's a, re a good reason not to use uh, brass sheet cages in ammonia compressors. Um, other considerations concerning cages are global acceleration. Uh, meaning if for instance, if you have a stationary conventional bearing application, you don't have to worry about it at all. While if you put uh, your bearing on a crankshaft uh, where it rotates and it becomes subject to um, 
larger accelerations than, than the gravity. Uh, that will definitely influence the usefulness of a certain cage, in particular for larger bearings. I, I believe, don't quote me on this, but I believe that uh, uh, this is at least with a size raised to the power of three. So, so size has a strong influence on this global acceleration. And some bearing types uh, frequently used in uh, such applications that could be vibrating screens, that could be connecting rods, uh, similar applications. Th there are usually special cages designed to withstand high accelerations. Um, also, other aspects from on cages could be uh, rapid changes of, of load direction uh, and, and the, the, the general way is if, if there is a possibility to select a surface hardened steel cage that is usually the, the strongest solution. That's about what I can say. Kamran has a question. Should we replace OEM selection by knowing each and every parameter or application in depth? Yes and no. Um, I would never touch a new machine. If it is um, procured, given the correct operating conditions and, and the correct the performance requirements, I wouldn't touch it because then it has been analyzed by the machine designer. However, 10 years later, maybe the operating conditions have changed or the performance requirements are different. Then I would certainly reconsider the bearing arrangement. So as long as a machine is uh, under warranty, I, I wouldn't touch it. But uh, once I know that my operating conditions are changing, I would absolutely reconsider the bearing arrangement. Maybe I should stick to the same bearings, uh, but simply if the speed is higher, I would go up a clearance class to avoid the risk for clearance loss, for instance. We, we can certainly assist in uh, actions like that. Uh, there's a question here. Any special points to be taking care of while selecting bearings for traction motors? Yeah, coming first to my mind is electrical insulation. Um, second is, yeah, well, number one, <laughs> there, there are three important items that are equally important. Um, and that is the uh, clearance class. Um, usually with today's um, traction motors, uh, we have quite a lot of power, so we can expect uh, a pronounced temperature difference between inner and outer end, and that puts a certain demand on, on clearance. Uh, secondly, the, the loading today is quite high, so the uh, interference in the ring to shaft usually is chosen quite tight and that also consumes clearance. So I would definitely look at the clearance for the traction motor bearings. I would consider electrical insulation uh, and I would also consider the cage. Uh, some traction motors are axle hung, uh, meaning they're not suspended. So they notice a lot of the accelerations from the wheels, passing switches and, and rail joints and so forth. So usually traction motor bearing cages uh, are special executions. I, I would not shop around for, for a, a cheap aftermarket option there. Uh, how many types of bearings available? I don't know, honestly speaking. You'll have to check the table of contents for for the catalog. Uh, question from Sankar here on insulated bearing lubrication. Is that different from normal bearings, I would say? Well, if we're talking about an electrically insulated bearing where we have this insulating layer 
on the outer ring or, or in the bore, I would say there is no difference. Uh, however, if the insulation is provided by ceramic balls, uh, I wouldn't say that there is a difference in lubrication, but again, I would return to that the sensitivity to um, thin film or asperity contact type of lubricating conditions is, is reduced drastically with the ceramic ball bearings. So it doesn't change the requirements for lubrication, but it might improve the resistance to not top-notch lubricating conditions. Uh, Anonymous has a question. What if in bearings raise RPM increased, but total bearings reduced? Will the result be the same? I don't really get the question. Uh, so please rephrase. Question here, for grease lubrication for roller bearing, how much important is the level? Yeah, it, that must be an evaluation made. There's no math or, or formulas that can make that decision. That must be an evaluation uh, between the expected operating condition, that is, how much dust is there? Is there water and so forth? Uh, as you know, the labyrinth has splendid uh, performance in the speed domain. There's no restriction for speed for a labyrinth because there's no contact and there's no friction. However, a labyrinth is a labyrinth. So the resistance to ingress from, uh, for instance, water is, of course, quite lousy. So um, I, I would not. Uh, try to find uh, a mathematical way to to define that. I would I would need to take a designer's decision, decision. that uh, this, this this bearing position will or will not be subject to water and pronounced dirt. And and based on that, I would make the selection between a contacting seal and a labyrinth. Okay, maybe we are coming to towards the end of questions. At least these are the ones that I can see. Yes, and I think maybe we should try to um, close off. There are some more questions, but we will try to answer them afterwards. OK, that's good. That's one option. Yes. So I would say thank you for all the questions yeah and thank you Hans for um, presenting to us and also answering all the questions afterwards not all of them will be able to be answered in this session because you have sent in quite a few which is fantastic that's good So uh, I would close off here. Um, we have an additional session uh, end of this day, uh, three o'clock CET. And as I also have been um, uh, communicating, the session are recorded and will be published on the SQF YouTube channel within the week or so. So thank Very you nice. all. Thank you, Hans. Sure. Thank you, and thank you all. Bye-bye. Hi, then.